Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You see, my tie, it says, blow the trumpet in Zion, for the day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is at hand, isn't it? The day of the Lord begins with the rapture. The blowing of the trumpet indicates the harpazo, the rapture. When we snatched away today, may it be today, Lord, from her lips to your ears, O oh Lord. <laughs> yeah, we long for that day, don't we? I hope you do. Yeah. Hmm? We want you to continue to pray for Juan and Mercedes. Juan will be making his departure soon. He's, uh, his bags are packed, and he's going on that trip into eternal life, into his reward. But at this time, and, you know, with the passing of those that we love, it's a very sacred and a very holy time. And so the family asks that you would just observe their, their need for privacy. So they're not taking any visitors at this time. And uh, just continue to pray for them. And Juan has been ready, and Mercedes is so strong through all of this. You know, it's just wonderful to see. Because that is our blessed hope. You do understand that. The hope is not that this paradise is here. It's paradise is there. Right? And I hope you realize that more and more. As you slept last night, what happened? I'm sorry? Missiles were raining down on Israel, the northern part of Israel. The war between Israel and Hezbollah has ratcheted up, and uh, pretty significantly. How many of you watch or listen to the Boots on the Ground report by Yair Pinto? Yes? One? Just one? Oh, you should listen to that broadcast. The Boots on the Ground, TBN Israel, Yair, Y-A-I-R, Pinto, P-I-N-T-O. And he'll give you an accurate, moment by moment, analysis and understanding of what's taking place in Israel. But nonetheless, uh, Israel made preemptive strikes into the southern part of Lebanon while we slept because they had intelligence that there was coming a devastating attack upon Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is a major city in Israel. You understand that? And so rather than wait for the attack to come, they preemptively destroyed, I mean, literally dozens and dozens of sites where they were going to be launching from. But then in reaction to that, Hezbollah has fired over 300 rockets, missiles, into Israel. And they're firing it indiscriminately into very heavily populated communities. They're trying to kill civilians, not military targets, as Israel does. So we need to continue to pray. Pray for Israel, because as, as I'm sure you're aware, this present administration has pushed Russia into the hands of the Chinese and the Iranians more than ever before. Um, uh, you, you should be aware of the fact that, you know, the leader in Russia, Putin, right? He's not what we would call a, a righteous man or a godly man, is he? No, no. But, you know, he was one of the Russian leaders most inclined towards being pro-West than any other. Did you know that? More than even Mikhail Gorbachev. And, boy, did they spoil that, didn't they? Yeah, Trump was trying to uh, take opportunity and develop a relationship, and then all we heard was Russia, Russia, Russia. And it was all disinformation. It was all slander. Uh, and we know the result thereof. We push the Russians into the hands of the Chinese and the Iranians. Do you know the saying that the enemy of my enemy is my enemy? And that's, that's the way they've reacted, you see? Because we made it very clear that they're our enemy. And we are fighting a proxy war with Russia right now. You do know that the Ukrainians have made advances into Russian territory proper. Yeah. And the missiles that they've used to attack Ukraine, where'd they come from? Yeah. There are missiles. So this whole thing is ratcheted up. Aren't we glad that God is sovereign? Isn't it a soft pillow to rest your head on knowing that God is in complete control? And that my father and your father, our father, told us ahead of time all these things were going to take place, and we're seeing it unfold right now on this very day. Blow the trumpet in Zion, for the day of the Lord is coming. Amen? Amen? Amen. Are you ready? I hope you are. A lot of people are going to be caught completely unaware. A lot of people who call themselves by his name, a lot of people are gathering together at this hour on a Sunday morning living under a false sense of spiritual security. 
Now, I've been telling you that for a long time, that you need to make certain of your salvation. Make your calling and election sure. Sure. The Sunday morning after the rapture, no one is going to be able to say, Pastor Ritt didn't tell me. You may not want to listen. You may not want to hear it. But no one will be able to say, Pastor Ritt never told me. I've been warning you, beloved, for as long as I've been preaching, because I do believe I've been given a, a calling like an end times prophet. And ever since I've been preaching, I've been warning the church to be prepared, be ready, be that bride. That song that we sang, that was so sweet. When, when worship reaches its highest form, Sarah, I saw what happened to you. Yeah. You can't sing. All you can do is allow your heart to be filled with such thanksgiving and such joy. That's when worship reaches its highest form. It's speechless, you see. And worship will be demonstrated by our sacrificial life. Giving our life for one who gave his. Is that me? What am I doing? I went electric, huh? I'm electrified. <laughs> Good morning, Mercedes. Good morning, Dana. We love you. So, very conceivably, what we read in the scriptures, what would take place in the end times, this second to the last world conflict, Gog Magog, could happen next week. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm sold out. There's nothing I haven't given for my Jesus. There's no area of my life where I have not allowed him to be Lord. What about you? Well, that's a question I'm asking you. Last week we had a family talk, didn't we? I hope you heeded that family talk. We talked about the 80-20. We talked about the 2%. If I am wrong, praise God. But if I'm right, be warned. The 80, maybe the 98 will be gathering together the Sunday after the rapture. Hmm. Is that not sobering to you to think about that? How do I know that I'm ready? How do I know that I am prepared? Because Jesus said, watch ye therefore. Luke 21, verse 34 maybe. Watch ye therefore, sleep with wine open. And pray always. The word is begging, beseeching God, begging him. What should I watch for? What am I begging him for? What? That I would be found worthy to escape these things that are coming upon the whole world. How, how beloved, how would I be found worthy? In Christ. How do I know? How do I know that I'm worthy? Is it my performance? How much do I have to do? How much do I have to give? What do I... It's very simple. Loving the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. Do you love Jesus? Now listen to me, beloved. That's the question. Do you love Jesus more than anything else in this world? Do you love Jesus more than your spouse? More than Igor? <laughs> Do you love Jesus more than your children? More than your grandchildren? More than your possessions? More than your position? More than anything this world has to offer? Do you love Jesus more than all of that? Now, there are ways in which that's demonstrated. There are ways in which that is measurable, beloved. I don't want to talk about that today. But I want you to think about it. Because if next Sunday is the Sunday after the rapture, no one gathering here will be able to say, Pastor never told me. I'm telling you, because I love you. Met with my son Thursday. My son and whom I love. Ever talking about my son? <laughs> and he's, he's, this morning, he's doing an introduction in the, in the book of the Revelation. And he said, Dad, I just want to sit down and talk with you, because I, you know, you know, you've been trying to teach me about the book of Revelation since I was a, in high school, and I didn't want to hear it then. It scared me. When I was a child, he was Leonardo's age, and I'd be talking to him about the revelation and the tribulation, and, and he'd do a low call through the living room thinking the thing was coming, you know? <laughs> he 
said, it just, it just frightened me where I, I, had, I know how one, had no interest whatsoever in eschatology. But over the last decade, that's changed that. I absolutely believe everything you taught me and everything the Word of God teaches that he's coming. And he's coming for the church of Philadelphia. He's coming for that bride that longs for his coming. That nothing in this world, no possession, no person, no position could ever compare to being with him. To know as I am known. And to experience sovereign grace like never before. Oh, beloved. Wow. But I want to suggest to you The majority who profess his name this morning are not ready. They're not loving him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They'll do their devotionals tomorrow morning, but they refuse to live a devotional life. They want to live their life, not the life he's asking them to lay down. Each and every day we're to take up our cross and follow him. So today, this morning, what's new this morning? Mercies. The birds were singing about it, weren't they? Did you hear them this morning? Mercies are new. Mercies are new. The sure mercies of David. We'll talk about that in a minute. But his mercies are new, beloved. Now listen to me. What does that mean? That means, listen, where, listen. If the Lord's convicting you, if he convicted you last week, if he can continue to last, last month, listen, wherever that conviction is, surrender it, yield it. Offer it to the Lord, and he will receive it, and you will have joy inexplicable. You can't explain it, but you can experience it. Joy that you're right with God. And there's nothing you would hold back from him, nothing you would not give him. And then you know you're ready. Why are you found worthy? Because of your love and devotion to him. And that love and devotion is measurable, beloved. Don't think for one moment it is not. Hmm. Well, that's not what I want to talk about completely this morning. We're back in Acts chapter 13. Pastor Darren, we got that map that I've been showing. And it's a little cold in here, says the queen. Anybody cold? It's cold in here. <laughs> I'm sorry. That, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm <laughs> I'm from New York, and I, I, I like it cool, you know? So I apologize. Darren, make me sweat. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about Paul's first missionary journey. That's what we're covering in chapter 13. And Paul, the uh, center of the efforts of the church or Christianity is there in Antioch. And they sailed from Antioch, and they went across over to Cyprus. That was Barnabas's hometown. And they... They witnessed the Sergius Paulus, the Gentile there, and that Gentile became a believer. And who tried to prevent that from happening? Jesus. Bar Jesus. And what was he? A Jew. A sorcerer and a Jew. A Jew, nonetheless, trying to prevent a Gentile from coming to faith. But he did nonetheless. God's will will always be accomplished, won't it? Praise God. And then they went to Pathos, and then they went over to Pergam Pamphylia. What happened in Pergam Pamphylia? He got sick. Sick and tired of this world, wasn't he? Is that what it was? No, no, no. He's sick. Malaria. He caught malaria because that was a malaria-prone area. And so there they went from there. They went up to Pisidia, Antioch. That's where we are now in our study. But what happened when they decided as a missionary team? Who was the missionary team leader at this point? Barnabas. Barnabas. Who was it at this point? Paul. Paul. Now, what happened when they decided to go to Pisidia, Antioch, Pisidia, and into the area of Galatia? John Mark left them. John Mark was who? Barnabas' nephew. Barnabas' nephew. Now, why did John Mark leave them? We don't know. We speculated. We give a few reasons. What were some of the reasons why he may have left them? I'm sorry? Go home to mommy. Go home to mommy. He was homesick. Mama's boy. Too close to the aprons. Needed to become a man possible. We see some of that indication in his early life, because John Mark is recorded there in the gospel. His name isn't mentioned, though. Do you remember where? 
Jesus arrest the young man who ran away naked? Remember any of that? It's believed to be John Mark. But anyway, nonetheless, that's, another, that's an aside. That's free. What, what's another reason why he may have decided to leave? He was scared. He was scared. They were going into the area of Galatia, into the mountain country. And those people were dangerous. They were the barbars. You know what they thought of the Gentiles there? Gentiles were fuel for the fire of hell, as far as the Jew was concerned, right? But he was concerned there, going to Galatia. And we know there was good cause for being concerned, because what happened to Paul at Lystra? He got stoned. And that's when he saw he went up to the third heaven. What other reason might there be? There's two other reasons why he may have left. Change in leadership. It was my Uncle Barnabas that led this program, not you, Paul. Who do you think you are? It's my Uncle Barnabas that should be leading this missionary effort. Possible, possible. What was some of the other reasons? Well, one other reason? Gentiles. Gentiles. You're going to share what belongs, the promises of the Messiah to Israel with Gentiles? His prejudice, his discriminatory attitude. So those are some of the reasons why he might have left. We, we don't know for certain, but you know what? He got straightened out. I don't know what he heard from whom, but he made an adjustment in his life, and he turned his heart back to God and completely. And if you have to make an adjustment this morning, please, please, I beg you, I beg you, make that adjustment, whatever it is. If there's an area of your life that you're keeping for yourself, it's not going to benefit you. Not at all. It's in giving your life away that you... You're the only one who knows this? You're the only one who knows this? <laughs> it's in giving your life away that you'll find it. It's in giving your marriage away for Christ's sake that you find your marriage. It's, it's always in the giving that you receive. For it is far more blessed to give than to... And the majority of those who are called by his name have no understanding what that really means. Because they just want to take, take, take. Rather than give, give, give. Hmm? <sighs> Nonetheless. So now we're in this area and Paul is given the opportunity to share his first sermon. How many sermons did we say Paul preached in the book of Acts? Eleven. Thank you. Eleven. And this would be the first of the eleven. It's one of the longest. Now, if you remember the last time we were together, not, not, not last time, but the last time. The last time we were in the Acts 13, not the last week, but last time we were in Acts 13. How did Paul begin presenting the message of the gospel? He went all the way back to the beginning of Israel. He used the history of Israel, okay, to show the message of the gospel of the Messiah who would come, be the savior of the world, the Messiah of Israel. He would come and save and went through all of that history. Remember that? And we, we started back further than Paul started. We started all the way back to... You can't go any farther back than... Adam, thank you. We went all the way back to Adam and then we got all the way to John. John the baptizer in showing that the history of Israel really gives us opportunity to share the reality of the gospel. The gospel is, is all Jewish, isn't it? The foundation of the gospel, fundamentally, the gospel is Jewish. It's a Jewish gospel about a Jewish Messiah come to save Israel and the world. The world. And so Paul begins by rehearsing the history of Israel. And that's where we left off. So let's pick it up. Chapter 13... We'll uh, backtrack just a little bit. Go to verse 22. And when he had removed him, removed Saul from being king. This is chapter, 20, uh, chapter 13, verse 22. And when he had removed him, Saul, from being king, he raised up David as king, to whom he also gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. Unbelievable. Because we know a lot about David. And we're amazed that this statement is made. I'm not amazed that it's made about David. I'm amazed that God thinks of me that way. And you. Aren't you amazed at that? Yeah, that's grace. That's grace. 
And from this man's seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had first preached before his coming, the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. So John was a forerunner of those born of the women who was none greater than, the apostle, than John the baptizer. And John was preaching a message of repentance. Prepare your heart for the kingdom of God is coming. Prepare your heart, the kingdom of God is coming. Prepare your heart, the kingdom of God is coming. And what's my message to you this morning? Prepare your heart, the kingdom of God is coming. The king is coming to establish his kingdom, his millennial reign. The king is coming, ready or not. Prepare your heart. And how do you prepare? By first beginning with repentance. What do you have to repent of? Those areas where I'm not loving him as I should. Those areas where I've not surrendered my life as I should. But remember John, the baptizer, when he lays eyes on Jesus there at the Jordan, he says, Behold the, the Pesach, or Peshka. Peshka in the, in the Greek text, Pesach in the Hebrew. The Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Behold the Passover, the Passover, the Passover. Now, easy for a Jew to connect the dots. But somehow they couldn't. Somehow they weren't able. The message of the gospel is so simple that all you need is a childlike faith to receive it. But why is it that it escapes so many today? Not just Jews, but so many Gentiles today. Why is it there, there are more irreligious people today in the United States than ever before? Why is it there are fewer Christian? Why is it that a church is attacked every week? Or churchmen every week in the United States now? Why is there such hostility on something that should be so easily understood? The blindness, the enemy, the enemy that's in consort working against us, the flesh, this world system, and the devil, right? But nonetheless, the Jews should have understood, as John referred to Jesus, as the, as the fulfillment of the Passover. And every other major feast of Israel, Jesus was the fulfillment thereof. They were commemorating everything that Moses did in the past, but every one of them anticipatory of something God was going to do through the Messiah in the future. And so he did. First four feasts literally fulfilled on the day. They should have understood that. And as John, verse 25, and as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I'm not he. Behold, there comes one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. And then Paul says, men and brethren, the Jews, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, the Gentiles. Listen to me. All of you, listen to me. And those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, Jesus, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, they have fulfilled them in concerning him. They fulfilled the voice of the prophets in that they condemned an innocent man. They condemned their own Messiah. They condemned the Savior of the world and put him to death. That's what he's going to say now. They would, listen, listen. Israel had the voice of the prophets. They had the scriptures being read every single Sabbath. And they missed it. I want to suggest to you that this morning, this Sunday morning, the truth is going to be shared from pulpits all over the country, and they will miss it. They will miss it. They'll go out the same way they came in, in their compromise, in their appeasement, in their selfishness, in their greed, in their self-love. <sighs> Only God, only the person of the Holy Spirit, can truly get us to the place where we get a divorce from ourselves. Where we no longer love ourselves more than anything else in this world, but love him. That is the problem. That's what scriptures tell me. The enemy without is not the one I'm concerned about. It's the enemy within. There's a traitor that lives in me and lives in you. And only through the person of the Holy Spirit and the word of God can you keep that traitor where he belongs. Silenced. In prison. Hmm? Yes, every Sabbath the prophets are read, but they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Verse 28 now, and though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. You read Psalm 22, read Isaiah 53, any, any of the, the shepherd Psalms, 22, 23, 24. I mean, you know, it's obvious he's speaking of Jesus. The Jews read every single year. 
Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, they fly over <laughs> 30,000 feet. <laughs> Why? Because it so clearly speaks of Jesus the Messiah, whom they denied, whom they sentenced to death, whom they have killed and buried in the tomb. Look what it says. They put him to death, verse 29, now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him. They took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And he was, hallelujah. Every, every Sunday, what do we celebrate? The mini the mini it's a mini celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. Every Sunday we gather together, we're celebrating the resurrection. Why? Why do I say that? Why, why do I say that? Every Sunday, Why? Because he was raised on the first day of the week. He was raised on a Sunday. And that's why the church gets together on a Sunday rather than on a Saturday. We don't get together on a Saturday. The Saturday Saturday. We get together on a Sunday because the Sunday is the first day of the week, and that's when he rose from the dead. And so every single Sunday when we gather together, we're gathering together to celebrate his resurrection. Oh, he died for our sins, our justification. And he was buried with our sins, our condemnation, our judgment. But then he rose from the grave. Glorious for our salvation. Amen? Yeah, yeah. That's what he's talking about here. Now he rose from the dead. Verse 31. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. And we are his witnesses to the people. What is a witness? Martus, martyr. Yes. Are you witnesses? I hope so. What percentage of the church witnesses regularly? Anybody witness this week? Anybody witness? I ordered a pizza last night and witnessed. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> I ordered a pizza and the, and, the, and the girl wanted to know how I'm having a great day. How about you? What's your name? Charity. Charity. Charity, I, I want to pray for you before I pick up my pizza. What can I pray for? I, I, I don't know who you are, but if I start talking, I'm going to start crying. I can't. I, I got so many things I'm dealing with right now. Oh, Charity. Let me tell you about Jesus' love and his love for you, Charity. And so it wasn't about getting a pizza, although she told me I didn't need one, you know. Not Charity, Gail. <laughs> but I look, for, I look for every opportunity to witness. Do you? Do you? Now, now. We're going to be teaching the way of the master, aren't we, John Michael? Sometime soon? Now, all we're doing with the teaching of the way of the master is we're giving you the tools to more effectively share what's already in your heart. The church fails if it believes it has to inspire you, excite you, stimulate you to go out and share. It should be a natural result of the relationship you have. You know, nobody, nobody's ever had to give me a class on how to share about my love for Gail. Nobody has, has ever given me a class and teach me how to share my love for my son. You share so easily, so freely, and so passionately those things that you love. And if you love Jesus, truly love Jesus, you can't help but share him. You know how difficult it is for my wife and I to watch anything on television any longer. Because as soon, as soon as they mention his name in a derogatory way, I have to stop it. I can't watch that. I love him. I love him too much to hear his name used like that. Do you? And it grieves me. It hurts my heart when I hear that. I don't care what foul thing they say. They can drop the F-bomb all day long. I don't care. Leave my Savior's name out of it. That grieves me. And it's so, it's so easy for me to share him because I love him so. 2%? I don't know. It confuses me. I don't know. So there are his witnesses of these things. Of what? Of his resurrection from the dead. Verse 32, and we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled thus for his, us, their children. So the promise that God made to those Israels, that future generation, or that, I mean that past generation, has now been fulfilled in them, that future generation, their children. And oh, by the way, you know the promise that we're going to be realizing very soon that was made to the church? 
2,000 years ago? I'm coming quickly? 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 Quickly. What's that word quickly? Tacos. These things are coming quickly. I'm coming quickly. Tacos. Not, not chronos. Not in a matter of time because it's been 2,000 years. What he said was quickly meaning when he does come. It's like the, where we get the word tacos, tachometer. Revolutions per minute. Whoosh. Fat, and it'll be such an alarming rate of speed. Listen, we're going to see things begin to take place so rapidly, so fast, it's going to take our breath away. Ah, that's what he meant. Quickly. When it, when it starts to happen, it is going to happen at such a rapid pace, most, most will be caught completely unaware. The shock of it all. Yes, God has... Fulfill this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, we went through that previously, didn't we? We went through Psalm 2, and what is Psalm 2? If you're going to head Psalm 2 up in a heading, what would you say Psalm 2 deals with? The exaltation of the king, the anointing of the king, the coordination of the king, the king Jesus coming to take that which is rightfully his this earth, and possess it, and become king over all. That's what Psalm 2 deals with, the anointing of King Jesus, and the fulfillment will be taking place at the millennial reign, when he comes a second time. Verse 34, that he had raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, for he has spoken thus, I will give you the sure mercies of David. That's a quote from Isaiah 53, 55, 3. What are the sure mercies of David? Didn't we talk about that previously? He's talking about sure mercies, and mercies are new. Mercies are new. That's what the birds sing, right? Did you hear them this morning? Mercies are new. The sure mercies of David. Second Samuel chapter 7, go there. There are lots I want to share with you this morning in this text. So much there, so much meat. Where did I say to go? Seven. Chapter 7. Second Samuel chapter 7. What we have for, recorded for us in chapter 7 is the Davidic covenant, the covenant that God is making with David, the king. It's a wonderful study to study through all of the covenants that God has made, beginning with the Abrahamic covenant, and all the way to the new covenant, which we're so blessed to have, isn't it? Yeah? All right, so anyway, God is talking to David. Now, you know what had taken place. David's living in this beautiful palace, right? And, and there's no place for God. God's still dwelling in a tent. There's a, one portion where the God is speaking through the prophets, talking to the people of Israel, how they're beautifying their own homes, but God's house is in ruin. Foolish. You, you can live in a multi-million dollar mansion, and it's going to come to ruin, isn't it? But you build a spiritual house in which God dwells. It's eternal in the heavens, not made with hands. Right? But how foolish people are. Spending so much time, effort, resources, their life on the temporal, a temporal dwelling, when they forsake so much that should be spent, exhausted on the eternal, on the spiritual. Hmm. I'm talking to a few preppers. <laughs> As I make some exploratory questions to see where they are with the Lord, not in a good place. Oh, but they're preparing for the apocalypse. We're preparing for the end. And oh, by the way, when it comes, you come to my house. I'll take care of you. No, I'm going to go to his house. He'll take care of me. And it's probably fitting that you make all these preparations. Because you're going to be here. <laughs> How can you say that? Well, let me rehearse for you what devotion looks like. Let me rehearse for you what love looks like. And it ain't it. Now listen to me, beloved. I, I mean it with all my heart. My belief is the overwhelming majority are going to be shocked the day after, the Sunday after the rapture of the church because it's a remnant beloved oh ye of little faith 
of little strength, excuse me. Oh, ye of little strength. Nobody even knows you exist. Believe me, beloved. Why do I say that? Because so much is just, just feelings. Sentimentality. I was speaking with the men yesterday. Who, who are the most prolific authors, mo most widely read authors in the world today in Christianity? Name me some. Okay, he's one. Rick Warren? No? Yes, Joel Steen. Joyce Myers? Ray Comfort. No, not written. He's not well read. Not as not, and we read him. Okay, but and and who's the other guy? Max. Oh, what do they all have in common? They all target your emotions, your sentimentality, right? Not doctrine, not sound doctrine, not your thinking. How you feel. What do you feel about that? And unfortunately, they're leading a lot of people astray because they're no longer embracing sound doctrine, but deceiving many, especially the hearts of the simple. Hmm? What I'm sharing with you is, is sound doctrine that can be derived from your study of the scriptures. It doesn't feel good, does it? When I say those things, that the majority of the people will be here the Sunday after the rapture, does that feel good? Oh, no. But is it the truth? Most of you don't believe that, do you? It's up to you. The Jews didn't believe what Paul was teaching either. Didn't, didn't work out very well for them. Everything I'm teaching you is true, and I can verify it from Scripture. I will never not teach you the truth. And you'll never not be able to say, Pastor Ritt didn't tell me. Because I'm telling you now, if it happens next week, and I'm not here, and you are, what should be your response? Repent, and get on your knees and begin to beg him to give you the measure of faith that you need. Because there's going to be a great number of believers, Gentile believers, going through the tribulation. You do know that, right? And I'm telling you this because I believe I'm that close. I believe, you know, this tie tells me he's coming and he's coming soon. I believe that with all my heart. I believe it could happen next week. And if it happens next week, I don't want to be remiss. And then I didn't tell you. Is that a holy hush? <laughs> what, what I'm saying doesn't feel good at all, but it's the truth. It is the truth. And if you need to adjust your life, please, please, I beg you, make that adjustment now. After the church is no longer here, the fullness of the Gentiles has been complete, the church age is over, and the remnant of the church, the body of Christ, that bride that we sang about, is taken off the earth. There is an innumerable number of Gentiles who will be here during that time. John could number this army that crosses the Euphrates. How many were there? 200 million. John numbers an army of Chinese crossing the Euphrates River, the kings of the east, he calls them, cross the Euphrates River, and he numbers this army, 200 million. But in the Revelation, he says there's this sea of Gentiles, tribulation saints, of every tribe, nation, people, and tongue. They're Gentiles. And he says, it's innumerable. I can't number this multitude who have to go through the tribulation. But they're saved, but as through fire. Their faith is going to be proven genuine. The faith that God gave them, God will prove it genuine. It'll be through the tribulation of that hour. But wouldn't you rather have your faith be proven genuine now in your sacrifice and obedience to God's word? Baptism, optional or mandatory? Optional or mandatory? It's, it's commanded. Jesus said, repent and be baptized. Now, baptism doesn't save you, but it's commanded to be baptized. Now, if some of you have never been baptized, I encourage you to do that. We're going to, if the Lord tarries, hope not, but if the Lord tarries, we'll have a baptism. Sometime next month will be announced. After Sunday service, we'll baptize those who have never been baptized because it's commanded. 
Now, it doesn't save you, but it's a command. And so in order to live a completely obedient life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you should be baptized. Is that true? <coughs> Tithing, is that optional or commanded? Oh. So you know where I'm going with this one. <laughs> there are commands of which most of the church believes they're just optional. 613 commandments, yeah, yeah. But of which most of us should believe these, these things are optional for me. No, 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 no. Now, now, there will be a time where everyone's faith will be proven genuine, the faith that God has given them. We'll talk about saving faith in a minute. There's a gift from God, not of you. You don't manifest that faith. You don't produce that faith. It's not innate within you. It's given to you from above. Okay, but there'll be a time in which every man, every human being, every man, woman, and child, when they enter from this life to the next, the faith will be proven genuine. It can be proven genuine as John's was, the Apostle John, the Apostle of Love, at the cross, risking his life, willingly laying down his life for Jesus, whom he loved so much. Because he knew it may have very well cost him his life to be there at the cross with the women. All the other, where were they? One was a traitor, and the other ten? Ran for their life. Preserved my life at all costs. Right? And so many, so many have that attitude today for much, much less. No, it's living your life for Jesus no matter what the cost. The other ten, their faith was proven genuine in martyrdom. Peter, this night you will deny me that you even know me three times before the cock crossed twice. And so he did. I can't stand in my strength. I have none. Neither can you. But you need to ask God to give you the measure of faith to believe so that you can present yourself truly as one who loves and follows him. The innumerable multitude will be those who go into the tribulation saved but not proven genuine yet. I can make an apologetic for that if you're interested Text Pastor Darren later. He can give you a three-week apologetic that I did on this teaching. It's very scriptural. It's very doctrinal. It's very true. You see. Otherwise, Jesus' warnings mean nothing. When he says, pray always, it means nothing then. If there's no reason for you to be concerned about being worthy. Is that not true? Hmm. This is what's heavy on my heart this morning. For you, I'm... I don't talk to anybody else. I, I don't have that kind of a platform, but I have a platform with you. And I don't want one person pulling into this parking lot the Sunday after the rapture. Not one. I want all of us to go together. Don't you? What a joyous occasion that would be. Hmm. Back to the text. Uh, we're in Samuel chapter 7. We're talking about the sure mercies of David. They're sure. And David wanted to build a house for God. Remember, he lived in a house, and God lived in a tent, and he's kind of feeling guilty about it. And he says, God, I want to build you a house. But, but, and Nathan says, go for it, David. What a wonderful thing. What a, oh, bless you, David. Build that house. And that night, God spoke to Nathan, the prophet, and said, David will not build me a house. Why? Too much blood on his hands. Too much blood. Innocent blood. A lot of innocent blood on his hands. Hmm. Yes, the Lord doesn't hear the prayers of the DNC. Did you read that article? That blogger? It's true. True. No, David, you can't. But here's what I'll do for you, David. Look at the text. Beginning in chapter 7. And let's look at it in verse 8. Now, therefore... Thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold for following the sheep to be ruler of my people over Israel. David never saw himself as anything more than the shepherd boy of Bethlehem. You know that? He, he, was a very, he was a humble man in many regards. He was a submitted man in many regards. And if David could have been anything else other than who he was, what did he want to be? A priest. Leading people in the worship of God. He loved God. Saul, Saul wanted power, Solomon, riches, fame. David, communion. David just wanted fellowship with God. Is that where your heart is? Don't you love those sweet times of fellowship with the Lord in his word, all alone, just you and him? Yes, 
following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone. I've cut off your enemies from before you. I have made you a great name like the name of great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people, Israel. I will plant them and they will dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them anymore as previously. Where's that place? Israel. Israel is the place. From the Mediterranean to the Jordan? No. From the Mediterranean to the Euphrates is that place. Right? That's what they're going to gain in the millennium. Yes, moreover, I will appoint a place for my people and plant them there, and they will not be oppressed any longer. Verse 11, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused the, you to rest from your enemies, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. David, you can't make me a house. I'm going to make you a house, David. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom and he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, in the immediate, he's talking about in the forever, he's talking about Jesus. Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. We're, listen, we're identifying what does it mean when he says the sure mercies of David. Okay? Just take you back to where we started. We're trying to discover what does it mean the sure mercies of David. And you go back to the Davidic covenant and you'll find the meaning. I will be his father, the father of Solomon. He shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the blows of the sons of men. But my mercy shall not depart from him. The sure mercies of David. We have the mercy of God that is absolutely certain in our life. The sure mercies of David. Why? Because of one greater than a David. Because of the son of promise that he's talking about, whose kingdom will endure and ever, and ever, and ever. That's the sure mercies of David. Look, read on. But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. That's the sure mercies of David. It's absolutely certain. What is certain? The grace and the mercy of God in Christ Jesus. Grace, getting what you don't deserve. Mercy, not getting what you do deserve. All in Jesus. And it is absolutely 100% certain. Certain. Okay? Sure mercies of David. Back to the text. Chapter 13. Verse 35, therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption for David after he had served his own generation by the will of God. How many generations can you serve? Only one. You know, I can only serve this generation, right? From one to a hundred. That's who I serve right now. David served his generation faithfully. Are you serving your generation faithfully? That's the question. Are you? Making this generation aware of what's most important? What's absolutely essential that they be aware of? David did that. He made certain of his generation. Mm -hmm. By the will of God, and fell asleep, and buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. What does that mean? It's a quote from Psalm 1610. Peter, Peter mentions it in his, second, in his second sermon. Go to 2 Peter, for, or Acts chapter 2, I mean. Go to Acts chapter 2 of Peter's first sermon. He mentions the fact that the Christ, the Messiah, would never see corruption. We recite that every Sunday. Don't we? Acts chapter 2.
Verse 25, but David says concerning him, concerning Jesus, for I saw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope. Yes, we will, won't we? When we, go, when we go to be with the Lord now, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But at this time, before the resurrection of Jesus Christ, well, the Lord has resurrected at this time. But previously, they would rest in the hope of the promises that God made. Now the promise is being realized and fulfilled. Moreover, because this was an Old Testament psalm, remember that he's quoting. My heart will rejoice, my tongues will be glad. Moreover, my flesh will rest in hope and Sheol, Hades. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made me made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of joy in your presence. So he's rehearsing the fact that now this Old Testament psalm was written when the believing dead went where? To Sheol or Hades. Now, let me explain this again, because I got a question on this two weeks ago, and I want to make it very clear to you. When we recite the Apostles' Creed, we say he descended into Hades. Hades is Sheol. Hades is mankind's common grave. It's not hell. Within Hades or Sheol was two areas or two realms, okay? One for the unrighteous dead, where they were temporarily being tormented until they cast into the lake of fire at the great white throne judgment. The other was for the righteous dead, which Jesus would refer to as paradise. When he spoke to the thief on the cross who made confession of Jesus Christ, he said, this day you will be with me in paradise. And that's where they went, down into Hades, and that place reserved for the righteous dead. It was also called Abraham's bosom, because Jesus taught of two men, literally, who had gone down into Hades, one in the area for the unrighteous, one in the area for the righteous. The one was being comforted by Father Abraham, the other was being in torment, and he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus back here to put a drop of water on my tongue, and I would be satisfied. And Father Abraham said, even if I will that he can't, there's a gulf that separates you. Send him back to warn my brothers of this place. Even if one would come back from the dead, they won't believe. But yet God in his mercy sent a Lazarus back from the dead, didn't he? Did they believe? No. But that's why we say, you'll not allow my Holy One to see corruption. You will not leave him in Hades. David knew he wouldn't be left in Hades or Sheol. It was a temporary holding until the Messiah was raised from the dead, and until the Messiah was exalted and ascended, and then he led the captives free. He led the righteous, those believing dead, free. That makes sense to you? Now, Gahana, that's hell. Gahana is uh, likened unto the lake of fire. The lake of fire is that eternal judgment. When Christ comes to establish his millennial reign, he's going to throw two people into the lake of fire. Who is that? The false prophet and the Antichrist. He's going to throw them into the lake of fire, and then he's going to have his millennial reign. But towards the end of the millennial reign, someone's let loose to do his dirty again to spread his slander, to spread his gossip, to try to cause division, to separate people from God. Say, that's what happens today. It makes my blood boil. Hmm. Nonetheless, before that rebellion is finished, God ends it. And what happens to the rebels and Satan? They're cast into the lake of fire. And what else is cast into the lake of the fire? Death. 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 Hallelujah. Death. <laughs> we'll see the death of death. Okay? So, Gahana or hell is very different from Hades or Sheol. Are you with me? Okay. So, that's what he's talking about when he said, you'll not allow your holy one to see corruption. Verse 36 of chapter 13 of Acts. And again, if you're new here, I'm a teacher, okay? So I'm not a preacher, but I'm, I'm teaching you. And so there's a lot to unpack in this sermon of Paul's. I'm not unpacking everything. I don't think you'd have the tolerance for it or the patience with me for it because there's so much more we could do. But we're going we're gonna to get a little deeper, okay? For David, verse 36, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw, and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. If we were to go back and quote Habakkuk, 
Habakkuk is quoted three times in the New Testament. But the first time he talks about faith, he says, the just shall live. The just shall live. The just shall live. You know that's quoted four times in the scriptures? Do you think God's trying to emphasize something? It's quoted here, and if you go to Habakkuk, you don't need to turn there now, but we're going to turn there in a minute. Uh, chapter 2 of Habakkuk, it is quoted in verse 4. It's quoted in Romans 1.17. It's quoted in Galatians 3.11. It's quoted in Hebrews 10.38. The just shall live by faith. Paul gives us some understanding of this when he talks about it in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, when he says, for by grace you have been saved through? And what else does he say? And that not of yourself, not of works, lest any man should boast, but a... Faith is a gift? Faith is not a gift. Where in the Bible does it ever say that faith is a gift? Well, it just go to 2 Corinthians. Is it 2 Corinthians or maybe 1 Corinthians? Maybe... 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Go there. When we have the gifts of the Spirit, right? Explain to us chapters 12, 13, 14. First Corinthians chapter 12, we're there. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away by these dumb idols wherever you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is the Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So everybody has a gift of the Holy Spirit when they confess Jesus is Lord, right? But then he talks about some more gifts very specifically. Verse 4, he says, there are diversities of gifts, but it's the same Spirit. Diversities of ministry, the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but the same God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit working. Who works all and in all. All the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one according to the profit of all. So the, gift, the spiritual gift is given to you for what reason? The profit of all. Every spiritual gift that you might receive is given to you to give out to the body. It's not for you. It's not self-seeking. It's for the sake of others. There's only one gift that's used for the interest of the individual. Who's that? What's that? Tongues. Tongues. Which is the least of the gifts and way overemphasized today. No, it's for the profit of all. Verse 8, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, what is it? Oh, so what is faith? Oh, faith is a gift from God. Not of works, at least any man should boast. You cannot be, listen to me, there's no system that man has ever created, no ism, no religious philosophy, no belief that could save you, that could give you justification. It's all by faith through Christ alone. The scriptures alone declare that through Christ alone, through faith alone, is grace given alone for the salvation of the individual. Is that true? Is that true? Because while we were yet dead in our trespasses and sins, Dead. Necros. What can a corpse do? Nothing. Nothing. And that's what he says. While we were dead, corpse, necros, God raised us from the dead through the power of his Holy Spirit, giving us a gift of faith to believe. And that, listen, you have people, unbelievers in your life? You need to pray for them. Pray that God would give them the grace gift, the charismata of pistos, of faith to believe, to open up their eyes, open up their ears. Open up their mind, their heart to the truth. That's the only way it can happen. What do we call that? We call that sovereign grace. That's sovereign grace. It's through grace alone, through faith. Back to the text, Acts chapter 13. No ism, no religious philosophy, no man made system, not even the desire of man, not even the will of man but it's all through Christ alone. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from the things of which the, could not be justified by the law of Moses. Therefore, beware. Beware, therefore, lest what, is happen, what has been spoken in the prophets come upon you. What come upon me? Unbelief. Not believing the word of God. But only God can put that belief in my heart. Faith allows us to escape judgment. There's a judgment coming upon this world. It is absolutely certain. The judgment is coming, isn't it? 
absolutely certain. It's inevitable, but it is escapable. And how do you escape the judgment? Faith. And who gives you the faith? God. And that's what you have to pray for. He says here, as he's quoting Habakkuk again, verse 41, Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish. For I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, the one were declared to you. If I tell you what I'm about to do, you still won't believe me. But yet I'm going to do it. Go to Habakkuk, where we find this quote in Habakkuk chapter 1. Go to the last prophet. Who's that? Okay, and then go four more prophets to the left, and you'll find who we're looking for. Habakkuk. Habakkuk. I'm, I'm not going to get through this chapter again today, am I? Too much to unpack, beloved. Too much to unpack. If we're here next week, we'll finish. And if not, let's sit at Habakkuk's feet and ask him. <laughs> Better yet, let's sit at Jesus' feet, worship him. <laughs> it's that close, beloved. Do you sense it? You smell it? His fragrance is in the air. You smell it? You feel it? His breath on your neck? Do you feel it? Oh, boy. Soon and very soon, beloved. It's our blessed hope. Yeah. Where did I say to go? What chapter? I didn't say the chapter? I didn't say chapter 1? Go to chapter 1. The burden which the prophet Habakkuk, or Habakkuk saw... The prophet's question, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you not heal? Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. And there is strife and contention arises. Therefore, law is powerless and justice has gone forth, has never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, preserve judgment, perverse judgment proceeds. Is that describe our day? Oh, man, does it? I would never, ever, ever have believed that I would live long enough to see such a perversion of justice, the loss of our democracy. We're not, listen, I tell the guys on Saturday mornings, the culture is absolutely lost. It's lost. There, there is no hope for this culture short of God's intervention, and I see no reason why he would intervene. We're under his judgment. Do you understand? Now, Israel of old, we, I, first message I ever preached as a minister, as a pastor. Way back then, I did a comparison between the USA Today and Judah of old. And I went through several of the Old Testament prophets and made a comparison of the USA Today and how God will have to judge us because we are mimicking Judah of old. And God judged Judah. And this is exactly what he's talking about in Habakkuk, the judgment of the nation of Judah. His capital was Jerusalem, the southern kingdom. Now, that's precisely where we are today. We're, and we're, are we're, that was in 1991. Are we far worse off than today than we were then? Oh. It's more true today than it's ever been before. The comparisons that can be made just prior to God judging Judah and Jerusalem and God judging the United States. Where do, you, where, do you, where do you hear anybody who has a national platform calling for the nation to get on its knees, to get put on sackcloth and ashes, to repent, to beg, to cry out to God for forgiveness? I don't hear that from anybody. Who? Who? Who is he? I don't even know who Louis Ingalls is. Yeah. But, um, I don't doubt you. Okay, good. Praise God for Lou. Lou and Pastor Rick, he's praise God. He's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a church of Philadelphia. Yeah, okay. But very few, very, very few have a national... But did you hear that at the, at the Republican National Convention? A cry for repentance? No, no. Make America? And that's what Judah was saying then. They, were, they, they humiliated all the prophets. They persecuted Jeremiah. Eventually they killed him because of the message he was giving. They hated Jesus said, which of the prophets has your fathers not? Because they wouldn't receive the message. Make Judah great again. That's what they were crying out. 
Look at the text. Look at God's response. Look among the nations and watch and be utterly astounded. For I will work a work in your days which you would not believe though it were told to you. For indeed, I am raising up the Chinese. I, oh, no, I mean, Chaldeans, the Chaldeans. I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also swifter than leopards, more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. The cavalry comes from afar. They fly as an eagle that hastens to eat. All, they all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings. The princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold. They heap up earthen mounds and seize it. And his, then his mind changes and he transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing his power to his God. What's he talking about? The judgment that he's bringing about upon his own people by the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. Because of their sin, because of their stick, because of the hardness of their heart, because they would not receive the truth. Now, you could not have convinced Israel then. You could not have convinced Israel in 70 AD when God destroyed the temple that they weren't in the right relationship with God. They were all resting in a false sense of spiritual security, believing they were in a relationship with God that didn't exist. That's much of Christendom today, beloved. The majority of those who are gathering together this morning believe they're in a relationship with God that doesn't exist. They're resting in a false sense of spiritual security when there is none. How many of you have a security system, ADT or alike? Do you have absolute security? No. You know what they sell you? The feeling of security. That's all. They don't, they don't give you actual security. They send, they, they, you're buying a sense or a feeling of security. I feel secure, but am I actually absolutely secure? No. No. I remember a guy coming to sell me the system. And I had a dog named Amos then, and he was protection trained, and he was laying by my side. <laughs> and I kept asking him questions, and he kept saying, well, you know, nothing is foolproof. I mean, so you're selling me a feeling of security, not actual security. Is that right? Well, you could put it that way. You know, somebody, Amos, watch him. Now that's security. <laughs> now, I told him, now that's security. <laughs> Actual security. <laughs> oh, beloved. Beloved, 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 I love you. I love you, I love you, I love you. Don't be duped. Know that you know that you know you are in the faith. You're in the faith, and it'll be demonstrated in a transformed life. You will be a light unto the world. Israel was called to be a light. Jesus was the light of the world. Paul was called to be a light. Who else was called to be light? We are. We are. You alone are the light of the world. You alone are the salt of the earth. And if you don't represent him, who's going to? Mm. But just as Mahat Gandhi responded, he, grew, he was educated in England, in a Christian nation. England was far more Christian then than it is. Oh, boy, it was... <laughs> Where England is, we're headed. Ask the question, you grew up, you, you were educated in this English, in, in this nation in England, you were educated under, under a, a, a Christian nation. What, what do you think of Christianity? And what did he say? Show me a Christian and I might consider it. Wow. That could clearly be the indictment today. If I listen with my eyes and not my ears, Listen with your eyes, not your ears. It reveals everything. Everything. So much of it is just a sham. So, so much of it is just a veneer of Christianity, but no true sacrifice and desire for the worship and the love of God. Hmm. Habakkuk is being quoted there in Acts. Why? Because there's a time of judgment that is absolutely certain that is coming, but it is escapable. But there's only one way of escape, and that's through Jesus Christ. And this is what he's quoting here. Yes, chapter 13, verse 41 of Acts. Behold, you despisers, marvel and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which you will by no means believe, though one were to declare it to you. Go around this week. This is your challenge. We're going to end here because it's getting late. And I have too much to share to rush through it. Go around this week and start talking to people other than in your communion here. And ask them if they believe we're, we as a nation are under God's judgment. 
and is God's judgment coming? And you'll be amazed how the majority of them believe we're not. And that, you know, everyone's saved. And why? Because love wins. Because God loves everybody. We don't, we, you know, we don't talk about sin and hell and judgment here. You know, we just want to build people up. We just want to emphasize the good in people. You know, I believe in the good in all mankind. I believe everybody deep down has a good heart. Is that true? <laughs> it's, it's, just not, it's just not the Bible. It's just not true. It's not the orthodox. What does the Bible tell me about my heart? Incurably wicked. I need a heart transplant. Amen? Now, beloved, spend some time this afternoon or maybe this evening. Get alone with the Lord and say, Lord, please, Lord, wherever, wherever my life needs to be more adjusted to show my love and devotion for you, would you, would you move in my heart, Lord? Lord, would you please take away those desires that are not appropriate and replace them with those desires that are wonderful, that are pleasing to you, Lord. Make me more a lover and a worshiper and a servant of yours than I've ever been before, Lord. Bring me to that place, Lord Jesus, where I love you with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength, Jesus. And then I will know that I know that I know that I will be found worthy to escape these things that are coming upon the whole world. I ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Amen.